welcome to another episode of Chatterbox with me, Mel Biggs. This month I am joined by none other than international melodian hero and my very good friend, Andy Cutting. He joined me on my sofa here at home because he lives not very far away and he was available to come and visit. And we left the camera rolling for about an hour and a half and we could have easily gone on for a lot more. So this month's extended episode, available over on my Patreon, is quite juicy. <laughs> In this episode, though, we're going to hear a lot about his start as a melodian player how he got into Blow Isabella and crucially how it is for him playing with other people because he's played in quite a lot of bands over the years and we're going to get to hear a lot of stories about that. Settle in, grab a cup of tea and enjoy this episode with Andy Cutting. Welcome to Chatterbox. <laughs> in person. So, Andy Cutting on my sofa. Hello. <laughs> Where you've been before. So it's... I have. Luckily I'm very local and it's great to have this local friend and mentor and just wonderful person just up the road. Aww. Although you're barely there at the moment. No, quite busy. Quite busy as ever, yes. Where are you coming from and going to at the moment? Coming from, I've been doing and I'm doing a lot of work with Anne Nepal, as you all know, you yes. know I'm sure. Last She's, month's guest. Yes, indeed, yes. Starting work on a new Leverett record. <gasps> I know, Ooh. very exciting. Is this uh, number five now or four? Seven. Se oh, yeah, I've completely <laughs> lost count. Oh, my gosh. It'll be album number seven. Oh, of course, because you've had a couple of live albums. Al One, a live, a, album. a live album, yeah, the lockdown album. We thought we might try and make a live recorded live record, like the second one. And we, so we bought a desk on tour with us with our sound engineer, Neil Ferguson, and multi track the gigs just to see whether it would work not to make a record just but, to test but to, to see you know if it was kind of good enough or we were kind of happy enough with it so recorded it did the tour and stuff which finished on the 2nd of february was the last gig 2nd of february 2020 <laughs> and then of course the elephant in the room happened you know <laughs> and we uh, about two months into that rob went i thought i'd have a listen to the uh, those recordings we did some of them are really good. Great. And so sent them out and we would look at, you know, and it was like, well, actually, there's more than enough for a record in it. Yeah, let's put out a double record. Oh, double. fantastic. So it was like, we didn't even, we thought we were then going to go, if it had worked, to then go on and actually do it. But we'd done it. Yeah. So it was like a weird thing of going, oh, we've made a record. And it was no extra effort than just going on tour in the first place, well, for you doing, anyway. Doing some gigs, and yeah, doing yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just off to France in two weeks' time to do a project with some Belgium and French musicians. This is the Cuvée, is that correct? Yeah, Which Cuvée was Special. Couple of, was it two years ago or something? Two it got years flooded ago. out, but you're oh, going back to finish right the there. album and finish the, yeah. the gig, is it? Their 10th anniversary is being stretched rather. <laughs> I think this might be year... 14 or something <laughs> if it's supposed to be the 10th and, and they asked us whether we would play and we went and we played for five hours <laughs> an extra one just we because... did we worked we played 40 things wow and they want to record it and do it properly so they're putting on a special event which is in a couple of weeks time so yeah i have to go over again I and remember to, all the pieces. To, yeah, I have to. That's my work to do. <laughs> and, and is it a re recreation of what you discovered between yourselves, or is it going to be new material that no, you're bringing to it'll it? It'll be what it is. What you did. What, what yeah. we did. I haven't played any of that stuff for two years. So I have, yeah, a bit of rehearsing to do. But I mean, just thinking, I've got a list here in front of me of all of the bands that I think I know that you've played with. And it is, I didn't count them up, but it's like half an a, a sheet of A4. That's a lot of repertoire. <laughs> and is, you don't yes. strike me as, from my knowledge of your bands, which is fair few, because I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan. <laughs> there's not a lot of repeated stuff. So a no. lot of this is just brand new repertoire that yeah. you are learning slash creating. How, yeah. how does that work in your brain? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It has to be said that your half a sheet of A4 or whatever is, you know, they're, they're not, you know, things that are still happening necessarily. You know, I've been in lots and lots of different bands with song based bands and playing for dances and Kaylee bands and all concert bands and stuff. So on the go at the moment, I reckon I've got, oh, hang on, I'm going to get my fingers out. I've got, <laughs> uh, I'll probably forget something. Uh, Blow Zabella. Top Hat, got the duo with Anne Nepal, I occasionally play with Martin Simpson, 
Uh, I've got a duo with a German fiddle player and singer called Kut Gudrunvata. Um, uh, Leverett. Leverett. Uh, did I have the? Look uh, at the list. And... We've got Chris Wood coming back. Oh, mm. oh but yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> not not gone in yet. Uh, we'll, we'll get round to that. Solo. So that's. I've got seven repertoires that are current. Wow. I think there's four melodies that are used in more than one one thing. So how it works for me. It's like having a filing cabinet with lots of drawers. When I'm in Blozabella land, I open the drawer of the Blozabella and, ah, it's Blozabella it things. There it is. If you ask me now to tell you Blozabella or play a Blozabella tune, I'd have trouble trying to remember it, recall it, but mm-hmm. with a bit of thought. Or think of it like a, having a zip drive for your computer. You know, it's all zip. You click on it and it goes, unzip drive. Yeah. And there's all the stuff there. And you go, is it in the muscle memory in your fingers? For me, the key is the opening the drawer, unzipping the drive, is that, oh, it's that tune. What's that tune? Oh, yeah, blows it. If I'm thinking of Topette repertoire, in my, I'm playing with to- Topette, there's no way I could recall any blows or bellow repertoire whatsoever yeah. at all unless I stopped and had a thing. And the process of, it's not repertoire, but it's tune-based. I open that tune, it's like whatever, it, yeah, the famous tunes of blows or bellow, yeah, the Rose of Arabia stuff. It's that, okay, yeah, I know it's in G minor. I know the shape, yeah, yeah, I can play it now. Yeah. I've got the shape, I recall the shape of the tune in my head and in my hands. Is there any necessity for you at this stage? Do you have to continually go over that repertoire or is it just a matter of what you just said and then it's suddenly there and you can play it fluently? If it's... It's a good, good question. <laughs> I couldn't suddenly play what I played on Solveig song, Blozabella. It's on vanilla or something, so that's 1990. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I'd have to listen to it. If I listened to it, I'd prob, it would probably unzip my, mm. li- open my little drawer in my head, and I'd go, oh yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. I suspect that you know, eight times out of ten, it would be pretty accurate to mm. what what it would be, but that that's through. I played that a lot. I just don't know why that song came to my mind, but. Lots of things like that. If if I've learnt them right and played them enough, it's easy. Mm-hmm. It's really, really easy. And it's not, I'm not saying it's easy for me to do because yeah. it's easy. It's not easy. It's really hard to do. But if you put in the work, the, the rehearsal, the practice, the repetition, for me what works is repetition at home but more importantly once you've kind of got the idea of how it works the way it gets solidified and made you know solid unbreakable thing is by going and doing it live so if you play loads of stuff do loads of gigs playing that repertoire it has a much better chance of sticking i'm finding that certainly with a duo with andy pog is that now we've started finally to do more gigs. It's starting to, not that I didn't enjoy it, but I'm starting to really enjoy it a lot more because I'm not worrying about uh, part of that part of the arrangement and then it goes into that little loop and that little figure comes in there and that drops out there and that does that and I have to wait there and stop coming. It's the different bass line, all that stuff, which is normally what's going through my head when I don't, I'm not so familiar with stuff. So now we're doing more gigs mm. and it's the doing the gigs that makes the difference. So now we have stuff in our repertoire that we've played enough to not have to, th- for me personally, not have to think yeah. so much about. I think that's what, one of the things I'm learning. We rehearse, we practice at home, but there's always that little bit of a cop out that if you make a mistake, you can stop and go back over mm. it. Or, you know, the the feeling, the sensation is not the same as being in front of an audience, which yeah. really like anneals that. I think, it, honestly, adrenaline is a big part of that process. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's part of it might be nerves but I'm not talking about that necessarily it's just that I am going to perform this and I want to do it to the best of my ability it forces you to make decisions 
very quickly, particularly, say, if you push a, a note that's wrong or you do, mm. you say, well, I've got to now live in the moment with this. I've made this choice to do this. So, yeah, finding that sort of extra, uh, it, it is just a step in the process of making it yeah. part for of me, For me, the, the life thing is the bit that, you know, it's the catalyst that, that sets it all, you know, it's the rennet, it's the whatever that makes the cheese, the cheese rather than it just being milk and some curds, other, uh, some curds and whey, you know, it's <laughs> like, it makes it a, a, a thing. Here's a demission, some people, you know, probably won't even believe me, is that for me, my thing that I am most, just about most terrified about in the world is being on stage. I do not like it. I've never liked it. I don't live for being on stage, but it's a place where special stuff can happen that would never, ever happen sitting in a nice room or in the back room of a pub or, mm. or in a studio or something. Something magical can happen. Sometimes bad things can happen as well. <laughs> but actually, in experience, in thousands, literally many thousands of gigs that I've done, rarely does anything bad happen. Mm. But to be on stage, I do, I do not like it. I've never liked it, probably never will like it. Occasionally, I've learned to live with it. Mm. But that's the place where special stuff can happen, you know. Yeah, you learn to make accommodations and kind of maybe I'm just projecting my own sort of feeling here because it's that's all right I don't think you've ever told me that and we've all known right. each other a long time but I don't remember you saying it like that before but I've also had my own demons getting mm. on stage and it's yeah. not I a comfortable place do. to feel but I think very few people actually admit, admit to it, it. but yeah. there are some people who live to be on stage they adore it yeah. and I find that weird yeah same <laughs> I think it's it's about finding a control I think for me it's like I have a certain routine and things that I like to do before I get on stage and when I am on stage I like things to be around me it's kind of like creating my own little sanctuary yeah, up there yeah, I want the yeah. microphones in exactly the place that I want them to be because then yeah. they're not going to be in my way I'm yeah. not going to block yeah. that person out and I suppose it can to certain you know that the tech crew who only see me for that period of time of my life could probably think god she's quite highly strung but I hope it doesn't come across like that. But I, and I don't think it does. No. But it's just, you know, we all have our own way of dealing with that. Oh, totally, and yeah. yeah. Making it feel yeah. normal. Oh, <laughs> completely. Completely, you know. Coming on to some of these wonderful bands that you've played with, I'm going to start with the ones I'd actually only recently discovered because I did my research for this. Um, <laughs> Fernhill. And actually, it was driving oh. along with Anna Pack and listening to her incredible music archive. And oh, yeah. you popped up on her car and I thought, mm. oh, that sounds like Andy Cutting, but I don't recognise the band. Ah, so yeah. where did that come from? So Fernhill... As far as I'm aware, they still exist as a thing. I'm not 100% sure. So Fern Hill was when I was in it, which was for three albums I did with them. Uh, it was a singer. Yeah, I mean, so it was I... her voice. I, I'm not normally someone who's grabbed by a vocal or lyrics, but her voice oh, to me is goodness. like an instrument. Yeah. Incredible. So Julie Murphy is her name. And she's originally from Romford in Essex, and she talks like she's from Romford. She's hilarious. No way. But she speaks well, yeah. and she, she's married to other person in Fernhill called Kerry Reese matthews who is an extraordinary musician. Oh, I joined the band. It wasn't even a band. It was a recording session at the end of it, or during the session, I was told that I was now in the band. Oh, right. It was a, <laughs> called Fernhill. There was a guy called Jonathan Shawland. They liked what you did so much. And... Well, it, it, we was a, it was a session, and they wanted to go and do some gigs. So it seemed obvious to have the people playing on yeah. the on the on the session. So we, so we did. We toured quite a lot for a few years. We did quite a few British council things and stuff. It was amazing. It lovely. It, bizarrely, you should say that I've got a gig with Julie and Kerry at a festival in Belgium in May. Wonderful. I know. Bizarre. Well, there we go. And I haven't. And I haven't literally haven't seen Julie and Kerry for. Seven years, eight years. Or well, so. I mean, if you're in Belgium, I recommend going to see this particular lineup of yeah, Fernhill. Yeah. It sounds like good times. Yeah, yeah, you know? oh, totally. The other thing that struck me with that as well, because I've not heard you ever do much of this, is it's, it seems very Breton or Celtic, yeah. you know, Welsh dance, uh, Breton dance. The, the rhythms and the tunes you're playing. Absolutely. Well, there's a, there's this funny thing. It's a thing that Kerry Reese Matthews has done lots, and Julia as well, but Kerry a lot of trying to find Welsh tunes to go with Welsh songs. Lots of traddy Welsh songs have lost tunes. Mm. And if you get Breton tunes, 
they work. Yeah. You know, it's like the Celtic nations, the Absolutely. Celtic different countries. Cornish is the same. And they're thinking, dance. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that so that happened. So I knew nothing about it, but Jonathan Shawland, who was a flute player in the band when I was in it, uh, he played a lot of Breton music and stuff. So I kind of heard heard lots through them. And in fact, it's the only time I've ever been to Brittany and played was with Fern Hill. Mm. You are known so well on the continent. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to even say it like that because <laughs> I travelled to France last summer. I've known people on the continent for donkey's years. And whenever you go, you always hear Blows of Bella tunes, yeah, either yeah. yours or Joe Freya's mostly, but also Dave Shepard's Rose of Rabery is very common on the yeah. playlist over there. Oh, yeah. I've just recently come back from Belgium with a workshop with Simone Batasso, yeah. who rates Blows of Bella as his Bible. Yeah. And it's just wonderful. We had Luca Thibault on and he said, oh, Andy Cutting, I went to a workshop of his and for him it was all about the engines. What's it like to know that, that really? you are it's so well known and so surreal. well respected? It's revered. utterly, utterly <laughs> surreal. Because it's like, I... I'm just, I'm just a bit bored. I'm a bit of a boring person, really. I'm a bit obsessed with the weird thing that apparently you lot seem to kind of like. <laughs> and uh, that being the I, I always <laughs> play in the box, you know, the diatonic button accordion. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you set out without trying to be too philosophical about it, if you were to set out at the age, so I started playing when I was sixteen, two weeks before my sixteenth birthday. That's when I first. Started playing the box obsessively for nine months. I shut myself in my bedroom, listened to John Kirkpatrick, three in a row, the English melodian, and just tried to copy him as best I could, you know, in a very obsessive way. But if you set out, I think, creatively to make a mark on the world and change, you know, move something, uh, some artistic thing forward there's only one thing that i think you're pretty guaranteed of happening and that is not that <laughs> i would say that that You'd was miss your mark <laughs> you would totally because you're yeah. trying to do something that nobody knows that doesn't exist that you don't know how to do nobody knows how to do a thing what i think is i was in the right place at the right time with the right tools the right kind of amount of hard work a, a kind of ability whatever that is ability is hard work you know hard work put in ability comes out you know whether that ability is good or bad who knows who's to say you know it's like is that a good painting is that the best painting in the world was that you know i love it i hate it you know who's mm. right and who's wrong you know it's impossible for me to have set out to do that all I knew is that I was obsessed with what John Kirkpatrick was doing and very confused as to why there weren't many other people who were as, as I don't know what the right, virtuosic, brilliant, whatever, as him. There were some people in England, you know, this is England, absolutely. And this Because that's all I know, all mid-80s? I knew. Yeah, yeah. So I was kind of obsessed with that thing and how John did the thing. And also I used to go, you know, I was in the Morris side and we used to go, or I was dragged out to see Morris sides from the age of four with my older brother. My parents danced. And uh, so I just, I heard the music, I saw the dancing, I heard the music and some good players, some not so good players, but I had no idea when I was very little and then as I was getting up, my brother started, studied classical violin. And, you know, in the classical world, you know, the line between cons international soloist and absolute beginner is there's a continuous line between mm. those of standards, abilities. And in the world of box playing, well, that didn't exist. So I was very confused as to why, you know, there were other great players. Roger Watson was, you know, he was fantastic. You know, player, you know, players like Martin Ellison, mm. Katie House, and um, Tony Hall. Tony Hall, absolutely Tony Hall. But there weren't many. Yeah. And in the local Morris side, where I was really lucky. There was a great guy called Pete Thompson who was, I mean, this with a huge amount of love, very functional, but a good player, good yeah. solid dance player, really good, lovely session player and stuff. And a, a brilliant guy called Ian Dedick who plays for Hammersmith Morris. 
who basically took me under his wing and used to take me to sessions, you know, and it was fantastic. Back to your question, you know, it's like all I did was try to absorb as much as possible and hear what people were doing and try really hard not to be judgmental of, well, they're playing a John Kirkpatrick tune, well, they've got it wrong. <laughs> Arrogant 16-year-old, you know, well, well, you're playing it wrong. You know, we've all met those people, you know. They still I, exist. Oh, yeah. they do, you know. In their droves. The number of times I've been told I'm playing tunes wrong is great. And nearly always when I'm playing one of my own I tunes. I was going to say. Almost always. <laughs> but it's like versions of tunes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing. Anyway, so I, I just... I wanted to just be, this is the arrogant 16 year I wanted to be better than the average. And the average was the people that I heard play every week in and week out. And I most certainly was not <laughs> better than average for quite some time. But then I made the kind of connection of the way John Kirkpatrick was playing and the way people I was hearing and realising, ah, the notes that people are playing of tunes and the actual written note, composed notes of those tunes aren't necessarily the same thing. Yeah. So I worked really hard on learning, trying to learn exactly what John was playing, not the overall effect of what I was hearing, because that can iron out what it actually is, you know. And then I was given, Ian Dedick gave me, a, did a cassette and one side was a La Forcelle by Mark Cron and on the other side was a record of a Italian guy called Riccardo Tesi. When I heard that I knew the instrument, the diatonic about the recording melodian as we insist on calling it. <laughs> We're wrong. It's a one row with our four or eight buttons. But anyway. Have your soapbox. <coughs> this is your moment. It's fine. It's fine. You can all laugh at me. It's great. You can all write on Melnet. <laughs> <laughs> still banging on about diatronic button recorders it's what it's called sorry and all that anyway melodian but i knew that the instrument that mark prime was playing was a melodian three row diatonic button accordion yes it was tuned in different keys i assume it's gc box had no idea but what the music that came out of my little cassette player played on that instrument, which I knew was the same as the instrument of my two-row Hona poker work, it was the same, it worked the same way. And yet the sound was like, well, it's not that instrument. It doesn't sound like John Kirkpatrick, so it obviously isn't that instrument. And then listening to Ricardo Tese's record, it was like, you can play this instrument in a different way. So I just went tried to learn some of the tunes off those records, mm. even though they were in, in different keys. It yeah. was on a cassette and the cassette player was running at a different speed. So it was like, <laughs> it sounded horrific, me trying to learn. But I suppose it just opened up my world of going, I like this, I like that, I don't care for this, I don't care for that. Love John Kirkpatrick and stuff, but the way that he's playing that, I kind of prefer it a bit smoother, a bit more like that, a bit more... To me, it sounded exotic. I'm from Harrow, northwest <laughs> London. Anything could sound exo more exotic <laughs> than that, you know. So I just made up a couple of tunes and, and I got to see it at Sidmouth Folk Festival. I, and our local folk club was massively influential on me. It was a Monday night folk club. Had some amazing people from the folk world, from Europe, who would come over and play big gigs, you know, weekend festivals. And on the Monday, they'd grab them to play at the folk club on the way back. I got to see a trio called Beauton sur la Provence with Evelyn Girardon, Jean Blanchard, and a box player called Michel Pichon. I hadn't a clue. I just knew they were from France. And they played the fiddle, the bagpipes, the hurdy-gurdy, the accordion, and sang. I got to see loads of... I saw Ricardo Tacy in my folk club. Well, I knew that you'd met him and he was influential on you, but I didn't realise how that had come about. Yeah, so. he played, he was playing with a guitar player called Alberto Ballet. It was extraordinary just to see somebody play that was physically, you know, to be in the same room, to visually, you know, YouTube wasn't a thing. I had yeah, and you hadn't mobile. seen John Kirkpatrick playing live at this stage. I had seen him yeah. several times over the years, but I didn't know because I didn't play the box and I was a kid. Right. But I did, in my nine months of working stupidly hard, he played a concert, he did a, like an illustrated history of the melodium. Ian Dedick took me to that. It was 
amazing because I was trying to learn to play some of those tunes and he played them and I could see how it was done. It was like, oh my God, okay, you can stop now, I can go home and just yeah. practice. I don't, don't care take about Take that mental snapshot and take it home exactly with you. Exactly <laughs> that. All these influences, you know, I just got to see them all in a very short amount of time. And then I was playing with a local guy who was a singer and stuff and they did a support slot for a band called Blowsabella at a benefit for Islington Green Party. And I met Dave Roberts, who was the box player with... And after the gig, we sat in the bar and played tunes, which was just lovely. And that was where we kind of first crossed paths with Blowsabella. And then a few things happened. I got invited to the early music exhibition to play a few tunes with Nigel Eaton, the hurdy-gurdy player at the time with Blowsabella. And then Dave Shepard, the fiddle player, and Dave Roberts left, and they asked me whether I would... Well, they never asked me. They said, do you fancy coming along and sitting in with the band on a few tunes that he knew? But I knew them all. Yeah. So I did the whole gig with them. <laughs> and then did some more gigs. That's the thing. When I said I had the right tools and I was in the right place at the right time, mm. I happened to be at a gig with Blozabella when their fiddle player was just leaving and the box player was just leaving. And that's how that happened. I'd also heard that Ricardo had sort of put a good word in with... Was it Paul James at the time, or was it... So, yeah, I missed that bit out. There was a workshop. It's one of the only workshops that I've ever been to. Ricardo Tazy was running the workshop, but he... GC Box, and everyone else had DG Boxes, and basically it was like... Carnage. It was almost a car crash as a workshop, and Paul was helping Ricardo to run it. And in that involved, Ricardo wanted to hear some English box players. And there were various people there. And then Nigel spotted me in the room and said to Paul, get him to play. <laughs> I was just, I looked about six or something, I think. <laughs> I stumbled my way through a couple of tunes, you know. And apparently Ricardo then went up to Paul James and said, you need to get him in Blazabella. <laughs> Which is kind of what a nice thing Thanks, to Thanks, Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> Again, back to the question, it's like all this time, you know, making up little tunes and then I joined this band that had, you know, international reputation. You know, Blowsabella's well always been far bigger in what's now Europe, you know. Mm. I think lots of people in England just don't realise that at all. But it was, I don't it, even know. I remember myself growing up in the session scene or, you know, the Morris scene, which was, you know, also the session scene, the folk world. And there'd always be these lush tunes played in sessions. And, oh, what's that? Oh, it's a Blowsabella tune. And it was just this sound bite that lived in my head until yeah. I, you know, discovered the band and discovered you. Yeah. I was like, what? Sorry? Why do, Why aren't we talking about this band more over here? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, th I think there's a, you know, there's there's always been an English problem with Blowsabella. Is that, and it's similar to thing Anne Newpold said to me. What it is, is that in England, most people in the folky acoustic -y world who've vaguely heard of Blows Bella, they go, oh, it's that French band. They play French music. Yeah. Okay. And it's still, people still think that, and they will always think that because that's what they've got in their brains, you know. Anne said to me, yeah, it must be strange for you because in England, everyone thinks of you as you play all this foreign European stuff. And in Europe, everyone thinks you play all of our stuff, but in a really English way. <laughs> I think everyone plays like me in England, which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah. The pressure's on. Yeah, well, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's very, very bizarre. So, yeah, the Blows Well thing, it gave me a massive platform. So the first year, so I joined at the end of 1988, that was the year I was born, by the way, just to kind of... All right, then. All right. All right, then. Okay, so I've been playing the box for two years. Yeah. When I joined Blazewell, a professional full-time band. Future Mel, just interrupting really quickly to let you know that I've had to shave down so many stories that you've already heard, but also future stories that Andy's going to tell you about his first gig with Blozabella, working with Roger Daltrey from The Who, working with Anne Neopold, the le new Leverett album that's coming out. If there's anybody out there he hasn't worked with who he would like to work with in future. There's so many things that I just wasn't able to include in this free public podcast, but if you are interested in getting hands on the extended edition then you can sign up to my patreon i'll leave the link in the description and you can get all of the extended episodes from the previous guests and anything that happens in future so go and check that out now back to the interview i was just lucky very lucky 
but also really just dedicated and focused to finding your own way with it really like yes yeah. you kind of attached yourself really solidly to these other players to, to learn from them but then like you say you filtered out what you wanted from that and you kind yeah. of like created your style quite quickly oh, but yeah it, but I, I think an important thing to say is I didn't try to make a style sure, sure I tried to do things that I I liked I like that bit of Ricardo I like that bit of you know Mark Perron I like that bit of John Kirkpatrick I like that bit of all these different mm. people and you know people we've nobody's ever heard of you know a massive influence was a guy called Bruce Warburton nobody will have ever heard of him at all he used to play for our local Morris or one of the local Morris sides and stuff. When he was in his twenties, he decided, "Oh, there's a women's Morris side. I'm a bloke. I'm single. Oh, that seems like a really good thing." Oh, what's this? <laughs> so he got a box and learnt, learnt to play it. He had no influence on how he played, so he just played in this. Mm. And I think if if there is anyone I play most like, it's probably this fella Bruce. You know, I'm definitely somebody that's been influenced by the Morris guys who after a set you'd go to the pub and share tunes with. Yeah. And they're, they're definitely the most influential on me for those early days of hammering the left hand yeah. <laughs> and having oh, like totally. quite a percussive style that yeah. I, I've kind of, well, people have complimented me on, people have noticed and mentioned, but I know what you're saying in that I didn't aim for that. It's just yeah. how it it's how it came yeah. out. Yeah. And that's kind of been the progression of everything. I it's think like it's, just... that, it's that kind of human musical filter of, of going... If you don't like what somebody else is doing and you're trying to replicate, well, why are you doing it? Mm. Why do, I don't like it. I'm not even gonna. I'm not gonna waste my time trying to do a thing I don't like. I think there's a lot of mileage in trying to in the learning process. My first nine months trying to copy John. I was trying to play to copy him, and that required a lot of work. After about seven months of that. I did start going, he does it like this, but I kind of prefer a little bit like that or a yeah. little bit like that. It's not because I didn't like or appreciate what John was doing. I was just being influenced by Ricardo, yeah. Mark, other players, and going, I like that. Yeah. So I'm going to try and do, not. I'm going to learn those tunes, that repertoire, you know, the european -y stuff from France and Italy. And, and naturally, some of it, the stuff you like or that, falls under the fingers easily mm. you start putting it on to other stuff yeah and then you come up with your own you know I think the most influential thing I suppose that I've that I have is that I have a particular style a stylistic way of playing it can be heard mm. all over the world oh absolutely like, which is that, that's your question it's really weird yeah, but it's influenced not just a generation, but I would say at least two generations oh, yeah. now like, and more, yeah. and it will yeah. continue to do yeah. so. But yeah. you can hear your style in, and I hope this is okay to say, but Julian Sutton is very oh, yeah. blended. And, totally. you know, there were moments where Saul Rose is playing, although I think Saul does now stand obviously on his own, but there are moments in his history where, you know, I remember a story of you telling me where he tried to be like you and mm, was kind of yeah. you know, going through that phase in himself you yeah. know of just well, you, I think you do that wanted to do. trying to find yourself you have to be you have to do it yeah. you know find whatever way works works for you you know it's like that stylistic thing is that you know that I made up invented whatever I didn't invent it I didn't make it up I just it was a thing that I felt was the right way for me to play the box. I'm not saying it's right for every, anyone else at all, but history would say that apparently it works for an awful lot of people all over the world. Yeah. It's an enjoyable way to play. I think that's how yeah. you've expressed it before. This is how I like to play it, the yeah. instrument. But it's not, you know, it's right for me and other people seem to get that. That's brilliant, but it has nothing to do with me. It's, it's like that writing tunes, you know, it's like I've written some tunes that have travelled and it's like I, did, I never... I just wrote a thing that I liked. Thanks. Worst thing you can do if you're writing, you're trying to write, make up a tune, is to try and please people. Yeah. Because if you make something up and it doesn't really please you and you think it's going to delight everyone else and make the, it's got loads of hooks in it and everyone will love it and nobody likes it, well, you've written a thing that nobody likes. If you write a thing that you like, there's something in it that you like... And nobody else likes it. One person likes it, at least, <laughs> and you like it. That's fantastic. Yeah. But 
if you do that, there's probably a chance that other people, some other people might like it. Some might not, you know. It's like my stylistic way of playing. Some people can't bear it, which is fine. It's great. We're all different, you know. Yeah. Back to the picture. Is it good? Is it bad? You know. Yeah, exactly that, isn't it? Like, there's other things out there to listen to if you don't get on with that particular totally, yeah. style. An interesting question that we've had from my Patreon. Oh, uh, cool. And a chap called <coughs> Brian, somebody who's new to my Patreon, so I don't know him that well. I don't think we've ever met yet, but he posted Hello, about... Brian. <laughs> about how playing with other people, which you are coming on my Patreon tonight, live on my Zoom, which <laughs> it will have gone out by the time this podcast goes out, but you'll be able to get the replay if you sign up to my Patreon. So there's the little plug for that. All to do with playing with other people, which I can't think of anyone else more kind of equipped to do mm. that workshop. Brian seems to live in an area that doesn't have very few musicians. I think he's um, in America somewhere. So right. you're quite very spread out when you're sure. playing diatonic out there. Um, but pending an opportunity to meet and play with other musicians, can you recommend some technical skills on the box or musical knowledge to be ready? At present, aside from solo playing skills, I am starting to play along with, to recorded music with the right hand chords. Any other suggestions? And I'm thinking when you join Blow Zabella, you'd obviously learnt to play with people in sessions, but as an accompanist, you know, elaborate on that. How those two things go together. <sighs> because there's playing yeah, melodies, course. but then there's yeah, playing, yeah. and you're so well known for it's, your accompanying. Yeah. It's chords, it's knowing your chords. And I don't mean in that kind of, you've got a master's in music, you know, music theory. It's, for me, I don't really read music. I've got better in lockdown. It's got a bit worse <laughs> since. But here's the thing. I used to have the telly on. I used to lie on my bed with my box eyes and anything, any musical thing, adverts, anything that came on, I'd try and... Work it out. Not work out how to play it, but how something to play, to go with it. Whether it be, you know, a drone or a rhythmic thing or or melodic thing or a harmonic thing. You know, on the telly, there's rarely an advert that's in G major or D major, you know, or E minor. You know, the safe, happy places on the box, you know. But just try and find something that works. And by doing it a lot... It became easier, mm. and I could find things that worked quite quickly. Sometimes I haven't done it for years and years, but I used to do it loads. I totally appreciate the not. I get asked that a lot, and lots of musicians get asked that. How do I find people to play with? It's really, really hard. But your question is great. Of that, how do you give yourself the tools so that when you find yourself in the position, I would find recordings and play along with them. It's fine being doing stuff on your own. The problem with doing stuff in isolation without reacting to anything, mm. i.e. playing with some somebody else, even if it is a pre-recorded thing, is that you don't know if it works because there's no there's no that. flag, there's no big red flashing light or a klaxon that goes like, when <laughs> when you when you harmonize it. Oh, it should have been a minor there, not a major. Yeah. You can't hear. Whereas simply just, you know, find some music that you like, you know, in any genre. Probably not a jazz kind of more, you know, something with a really complicated harmonic structure, chord sequence. Probably stay away from that just because it will it'll confuse you and it will also make you think you're rubbish. Because it, unless you know that chord sequence, those changes you don't stand a chance you know in your kind of initial steps by all means then go off and study those pieces yes. there's yeah. stuff online you know you have probably years and years worth of stuff online to do that with but personally speaking i would just listen to something you kind of like and try and work out how to play it whether it be you know this youtube thing is just extraordinary mm. Phenomenal. It's like when I when I started my thing, as I said before, a cassette recorded from the speaker from a record player. That was how I did it. There was no amazing slowdowner. <laughs> there was no pitch shift ability. So we're really lucky. So take a bit of time. Find a tune you like. Find a, a song you like. Get the amazing slowdown or whatever. Slow it down. 
you know, be meticulous about it, slow it down, get it in a key that you know that you could, feels like it could work on the instrument, sit down, write down, write it down, whatever, you know. Yeah. And then take it back up to tempo. Or, you know, don't change the pitch. Learn to play in weird keys. Be like, there was a oh, amazing box player in the Scottish Borders, I think he was, a guy called Ben Avaris, who didn't have a clue about his box, DG, box, a bit like Tim E. D. in the coming to... Bell, yeah. Who just, who loved classical yeah. music, got DG box, but just... He made a little cassette of stuff I do have it somewhere and it's quite extraordinary mm. of what no knowledge or teaching can do for some people. It's like no rule rather than yeah. loads of rules, no rules at all. Just do what and you playing can. classical music on it and it's still sounds like I own a poker work, but which is no bad thing, <laughs> despite what people may think about me. Uh amazing. Absolutely amazing thing, you know. So don't be... Don't be limited. Don't be limited, you know. Try the no rules thing, but we all kind of like rules. It's mm. a very human thing, you know. But be prepared to just try different things and be prepared to get it wrong. Mm. It's like I'm forever saying to my kids and stuff, you know, learn by your mistakes. If you make no mistakes, it's probably pretty boring. <laughs> but you make mistakes, it's like, cool. Yeah. I know, I now know, don't go there Yeah. at that point. Brilliant. So I'm going to go somewhere else and you might find some other thing that's yeah, yeah. amazing, you just know. Just making that choice in the moment to not totally. go down that road that you just did, yeah. Totally. One of my big things as a teacher, and I sort of say this to so many people, when they get to a stage and they're like, oh, I want to play some French music, does that mean I'm going to have to buy a GC or a CF yeah. or a different... I'm like... No, not at all. You can play any kind of music on a DG or any kind of other yeah. instrument. You know, it's kind of, it's not a limitation in my opinion. The only thing is, is if you want to go to France and play in sessions there, then realise that they will predominantly be playing GC boxes. So then that's another question, another hurdle. But if it's just you at home by yourself and you want to work out some lovely yeah. French music... Yeah. go ahead knock yourself out and absolutely try and play it in d minor and g minor it's you know doable to a point on a two row but you know it's it's part of that process of what you're just saying absolutely if you play with other people and stuff and they want to play things in different keys i try very hard to limit myself to playing a dg box and a cf box and that was simply because when i joined blazer bella lots of tunes d minor and g minor and it's so Which are much, nice on a CF which, if yeah, you don't it's know. like playing an E minor or A minor yeah. on the DG box. So it's just so I deliberately limit myself to that until I made a B flat, E flat box. And then it's like It's oh, pretty much what you're playing now, is it? At home I play I in yeah. fact I haven't played it for many months and I got it out this morning. I got my B flat E flat. Is it box happy? Out. Oh, it's delighted. Oh, good. Almost as delighted as I was. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice... I remember when you first made that with Emmanuel Parazel and you brought it to Wantage, I think, when we... Yeah. Uh, I met Andy at a series of workshops that ran at the time in Wantage. And, uh, yeah, you just brought it back from France. You'd been with Martin Connolly, I think, making a box. Is that Martin right? Martin Sorry, Martin O'Connor. Um, I'm thinking of two different people and merging them with one. And yeah, I'm, I thought, wow, he's made a really lovely box yeah, there. Yeah, no, it is. I'm very, very <laughs> And it's just lucky. mellow, doesn't it? But my word, of, my word of warning about all that stuff is that as soon as you go, oh, I've got a different, I've got a GC box. Oh, I really want a CF box. Oh, a B flat E for, oh, an EA box. And suddenly it's like, <laughs> suddenly, you know. You've got 18 instruments. You've got, yeah, exactly. Which you kind of. <laughs> which I've got, yeah. It's great. <laughs> But as my wife pointed out to us, somebody, somebody came up at a gig somewhere at a festival and was saying, asking me how many boxes I got. I said, and they turned to my wife and kind of said, what do you think about that? And she, mistakenly, I think, you know, she said, well, the thing is, it's his job. If he says he needs another box, he needs another box. <laughs> I'm the winner. <laughs> That's a rarity that you ever get that. Oh, but yeah. yeah, I think that, that, you know, tax deductible and all that. <laughs> if you don't know already, Andy mentored me for a year, but it went on because you're such a lovely person and you were always at the end of the phone don't when I needed it. you. But 
it, for the official year that you mentored me, I think we met five times, one of which I can remember we did some stuff on 3-2 hornpipes. But yeah. I, we just chatted a lot of the time. But one of the things um, that I didn't ask you at the time, because as I've now had 10 or more years since that wonderful start to my career, I have learnt about communication and how important it is when you're working with other people. Yeah. You've worked with so many different types of people, different different worlds, different, completely removed from the folk world. Oh, yes. Roger Daltrey <laughs> yeah. and Sting and different people. What is it to you to be a good communicator? And have you got any errors and boobs that you want to share? Like, I mean, obviously you probably have, but like, how does it work for you? And in terms of fitting in with other people and making a job work smoothly, but also having your opinion and, and voicing your opinion, because I struggle with that. It's... Mm. It so depends on the... For me, it so depends on the situation. Basically, as soon as you step outside of the cuddly, cosy folk world, nobody has a clue what this instrument is. I did a session for a guy called John Isley, who was the bass player in Dire Straits, and it was at a studio of this guy called Guy Fletcher who is related to Mr. Tumble, those are people who have grandchildren of a certain age or whatever, I turned up to do this and I got the box out of the case and they were like, oh, cool, 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 cool. And Guy Fletcher was producing went, you have got a proper accordion though. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, like a piano accordion? He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my I God. said, I said, yeah, I don't, I don't play a piano. So he just didn't, he's just the knowledge okay. of the yeah, world yeah. of accordions. So, just you're in a, yeah. so you're in a situation where people don't know what you do, <laughs> yeah. what you can do. And very often it's, if you're working with people, you know, have producers or have a strong idea, they will tell you yeah. what's, what they want. You are, as a session musician in that situation, it's the sound they want and they'll ask you to do impossible thing i once got asked to play it god this is a long time ago it was a german singer signed to ktel records some of you remember that singing timey kangaroo down sport <laughs> in a country and western style at one point in the song it changed key went up a semitone oh every God. four bars. Oh, my God. <coughs> it was horrific. I really want engineer. to hear that track. <laughs> I don't ever want to hear it ever again. You know, I played on Chumbawamba, one of their records, So, or I don't know, something. They decided they were, it was, I think it was one of their last electric records they did, and they decided they didn't want electric keyboards on the record for whatever reason and they asked me whether i'd go and basically be the keyboard player on the record but loads of their songs their things are in weird you know weird key a flat and you know c c sharp major and so it's like not a chance but the the one of the band who was engineering it who's now Leverett sound engineer neil oh. ferguson he basically took the tracks i said Look, I can do the what keys this in this track's in there. Okay, cool. He'd take the track, pitch shift it. Yeah. Which is easy to do yeah. now on the computer, it's nice and easy. Pitch shifted it so that I would you know, what keys it in, where's the closest on what box? Yeah. Okay, do that. For me to it's like I don't ever it I'm always for me very respectful that it's their thing. What do they want me to do? Work with Roger Daltrey. It's like, here's some Who oh, songs. I don't, he doesn't tell us. There's a musical director, yeah. MD, for that. When I first started doing stuff, I'd learn the songs and they just were like, there's not even the accordion part on bloody squeeze box, you know. So it's like, <laughs> I just learned some chords, you know, went through. Fortunately, all the Who stuff's been charted, so that's quite easy to find online. So I didn't have to do that. And I turned up and they like ran some songs I played along. Absolutely delighted. And then, you know, other things. Ah, can you do a bit like that? Yeah, cool. It's their thing. 
what do they want? But th- that's for when you're a session musician or you've been roped into work with some, you know, interstellar musicians. Yeah. Like that, um, but yeah, when but it's I, well, creations I... of your own bands <coughs> and, you know, like the trios and the duos that you've mm. worked with. So when it's literally brand new material, if how it's does your, that work But you? if you are, if it's your thing, if it's your band. So there are two things. It's either somebody's band or it's all your band. In my in my brain, you know that's so. If it is I'm trying to think of a of an example, I mean like Simpson cutting Kerr, for instance, which is it's three people. Of... It's three people's band. Mm. It's 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 our band. It's a trio, and nobody has a bigger voice than anyone else. Just because somebody might be bringing more material doesn't necessarily mean they yeah. have decided that's what they wanted to be i suppose i'm very careful of working with people who are empathetic yeah. to other people's ways of working you know i've worked i've been in bands with whoever shouts the loudest is right and it's not for me it's like it's fine if it's your band whatever you want to do but if it's our band you know obviously if you have a six seven piece band some voices get heard more than others which is in my school in my head that's fine then if somebody has a really terrible idea or a, an idea that one perceives as being terrible and they think it's the best idea in the world for me there's a little devilment in the and this sounds really perverse but in making that what i think is a pretty poor idea really good what can i do to make that thing i don't like a thing that i like yeah and i've got to do it because i don't like that (laughs) whereas for lots of people it's like i don't want to do that i think that's awful yeah and it could be a real kind of throw your toys at the pram moment which would have happened of course but yeah but yeah it's more positive to sort of try and work with it you know i also work very much the principle of keeping my head down unless i feel strongly about mm. something because I find that I I find it exhausting to fight people musically it's just hard work and it's only music it's like <laughs> it doesn't matter you've got a brilliant idea that you think is the best thing since sliced bread fantastic great it's atrocious but obviously I'm smiling again yeah well let's give it a go then I'm yeah. gonna try desperately hard to find a way to make it good then you'll be happy then the atmosphere will go, and we'll all chill out and have a nice time, and you'll be delighted. Yeah. And I'll be and delighted because I've got a bit that I kind of like yeah, and I won. <laughs> you've proven to yourself that, oh, I can take whatever rubbish it's easy. Or it's, <laughs> it's easy to, it can be easy. If you're in a, in a group, duo, trio, quartet, whatever, and you work a lot, you play a lot together, it depends on what kind of what level and how intensely that is. It can be, especially if touring, it can be very easy to fall out. Mm. That's no fun for anyone Mm. at all. So it's like, try and find a way, you know, I think I'm probably still around because I tend to get on quite well with most people, you know. But you've found a way to make that happen. Yeah. You know, it's part of your nature, but it's also part of your nurture of yourself and learning how to do the job, really, isn't it? That's what it is. Yeah, do your your job as best you can. We're not all, you know, we don't all get it right all the time. I certainly don't get it. It's like, I get things, you know, sometimes monstrously wrong, you know, but it's like, it's all part of the life's rich it's how you then yeah you know it's it's, and it's the recovery (laughs) how how you yeah how you deal with it you know which is a that's a lesson in life isn't it okay totally i i messed up there how do i make this right (laughs) yeah be honest be totally honest go look i'm really sorry i can't play this at the moment you know i'm not um it's not happening for me at the moment you know i haven't had a chance to Mm. actually learn this particular thing it's fine. Yeah. If somebody gives you a hard time about it, maybe they're not the right people to be working with, you know. It's mm-hmm. like there's always there are always other people. Sometimes you might have to wait quite some time to to meet those people or whatever. Or maybe you never will. But that's a far healthier situation to be in 
than in a situation of being with you know people who demonstratively don't like what you're doing mm. or pick holes in whatever you're doing. It is only music. It mm. doesn't matter. It matters greatly, of course, but it doesn't matter, you know. That was the best bit of advice you ever gave me. It took me a while to... You know, I said just off camera before we started this that it's only just gone in in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> it hasn't. I have revised it and gone back over it, but the turn your give a shitter down you know, or yeah. you know kind of care less about what you're doing and like you just said it matters greatly but it doesn't matter if it, if to it, the be all and end all no. of everything else if it, <laughs> if it affects you stops you having it's like that that great thing it's not it's not cool i'm going to work music <laughs> so i'm going to play hmm. music playing music yeah. it's playing i think it's easy to lose the joy in it you know 100 percent. wonderful i've still got so many questions but i think we've really kind of gone around so many beautiful houses in this conversation i'm really really so grateful that you offered you're very to, very you know, welcome you said yes to this and <laughs> that we've been able to do it in person my I very know, first yeah. in-person podcast um so thank you so much for watching everybody um andy have you got anything to plug like anything like up and coming over the next few months like, do you know where you're going to be no, tomorrow? Uh, Leverett are going on tour in uh, April. Ah. Is that end of April, something like that? We're okay. on to Leverett, yeah, Leverett band. And it'll be nice to see people and, and watch me trying to remember... Open up your Leverett filing hundred tunes, yeah. <laughs> Dear me, the thought of a new record means that that'll be up to 120 or something. Yeah. You can catch up with Andy online with um, andycutting.co.uk. Is that correct, your website? You, ca you can, then... but I wouldn't look because I have no access. I've lost access oh, no. to my website. I can't do anything. I can't change dates. I can't do anything. It's hopeless. So I need to rebuild a new website. Uh, oh. Well, maybe someone like Anne Leopold who is building web websites. <laughs> with, with her spare time. Yeah, I know. She's an amazing... <laughs> but... Uh, yeah band obviously i'll put i'll put links to bands that we've mentioned downstairs in the description your facebook page um is updated more regularly isn't yeah it? isn't it and yeah like occasionally that, look at that blows of bella are going out as well i know that so i'll put oh yeah blows of bella in may yeah. yeah we've got blows of other things yeah cool yeah oh thank you so much you're welcome wasn't that just something? I am so grateful to Andy for giving his time to me. Thank you so much, Andy. If you haven't done so already, I'd really appreciate a like and a share of this podcast. Give me a five star rating on Apple Podcasts if you listen there. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Do all the good stuff to really help promote this podcast series. Subscribe to my Patreon if you're interested in getting the extended episodes. This month's is rather beefy because I left quite a lot in. You will also be able to get all of the previous episodes of the extended editions. I'm going to leave links to all of that in the description, so do go and have a look. And I'm also going to leave a link to Andy's guest tutor, Melanar, which he did for me in March. And you'll be able to go and learn what it is to play with other people and how you can get better at playing with groups. Really useful for him to have given all of his words of wisdom and advice. And you can get that via my Patreon. This month over on my Patreon, my guest tutor is the wonderful Pascal Rubens. She is one half of the Narragonia duo and she's going to be doing a Melinar tutorial on the 25th of April. That's a Thursday night. It will be 7pm UK time. You can join on Zoom live or if you can't make the live, then you can catch up with the recording afterwards. Topic is right hand rhythm and accompaniments. She is the queen of rhythm in my opinion and I absolutely love watching her control and mastery of accompanying tune and and all of the other musicians that she plays with. So if you're interested in joining in with that and learning all of her pearls of wisdom, we're going to be leaving the link down in the description. That's it for this month. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again next month. Bye.